The process of turning a three-dimensional scene into a two-dimensional image or movie is known as rendering. So let's say we have our 3D scene here and we want to share it with somebody as an image. Well, we just need to go to render and render image or use the hotkey F12. Since it's just a cube, this is going to render really fast. And then we can go to image and save to save this out. I would recommend saving it out as a PNG. And I'll just call this cube. Then click save as. And now we can open this up in any photo viewer. I'll go ahead and close the rendering window. And one thing you might have noticed is that our render was not from what we're seeing in the viewport, but it was from our camera's perspective. And that's because in Blender, you always need a camera to render something. If I go ahead and delete my camera and I go to render and image, then it tells me I can't because I don't have a camera. So let's go ahead and hit shift A, go back to camera, move this off to the side and just rotate it into place. Now it's going to be really difficult to try to get this, you know, rotated and all that stuff exactly right. So one hotkey that's really helpful to know is control alt and then zero on the number pad. And that'll snap the active camera to whatever you're looking at in the viewport. So if you want to render from this side, you can just move your viewport there, hit control alt and then zero on the number pad and snap your camera right there. Alternatively, you can go to view down to align view and then choose align active camera to view. A couple helpful tips for this while we're at it is that if you just select your camera while you're in the camera view, you can just hit G and move it around. If you hit R, it'll try to rotate it according to the view, and that's not super helpful. But if you double tap R, then it'll go into a free rotation, and that's a little bit easier to navigate. You'll notice that I'm holding shift to make it go a little bit more subtly. Or you can rotate along the Z axis or the X axis, whatever you need to do. Now, some people find it a little bit more useful to lock the camera to the viewport and set up their scenes that way. To do that, we have to go over to the sidebar. So I'll pop it open and go down to the view menu. And under view lock, we have lock camera to view. Now, when I orbit around my viewport, my camera moves with it. I can zoom out, go to wherever I want. And then when I'm ready to jump out of camera view, I can turn off lock camera to view and then just orbit away. That'll pop me outside my camera. And if I ever want to go back to my camera view, I can either click the camera icon over here in the little navigation gizmos to jump in and out, or I can use the hotkey zero on my number pad. Alternatively, we can also use the tilde hotkey, which is the view pie menu. View camera. And if I hit that again, it'll jump us right back out. Again, the tilde key is the little squiggly line to the left of the one on the US keyboard. Okay, so we know that whenever we hit render, we're going to render from the camera's perspective, but what happens if we have more than one camera in the scene? I'll go ahead and hit shift A and add another camera and just move it off to the left here. And if I jump into camera view with zero, you'll see it's always going to the same camera. Well, whichever camera is the active one is set as a scene property. So in different scenes, you can have different cameras and switch between them. And we don't need to get into all of that just yet, but just know that if you want to switch which camera you're looking through, you can go to your scene properties, which is the little cone and sphere and dot icon in the properties editor. It's a pretty good representation of the scene, but in the top panel, just labeled scene, we can switch the camera from camera to camera.001. And we can tell which one is the active one because that's the one with the filled in triangle. So if we switch back to camera, then that one has the filled in triangle and we know it's the active one. We can also make a camera the active one by hitting control zero after we select it. So if I select this one, hit control zero, it'll switch to it and uh, set it as the active one. Really in this lesson, I want to talk about rendering, but it's important to know that that's always going to happen from the camera's perspective and you need a camera in order to render. Now, maybe you don't want to do a full render and you actually just want to export what you have here in your 3D viewport. And you can do that from the view menu and just do viewport render image. That'll just export exactly what you see as an image. So if you're looking for a fast way to save your renders, then you can do this instead. You'll notice that has the overlays and all of that stuff included with it. Like I mentioned before, rendering is just the process of taking a three dimensional scene and turning it into a two dimensional image or movie. And this is actually happening all the time if you have a 3D viewport open, because of course we're looking at something on a flat monitor. So Blender is already translating that 3D data into a 2D image for us as we move around. It's just using a really, really fast real-time render engine that's super simplified. So it doesn't give us a bunch of fancy effects, but it works really well for quickly editing objects. What we see here in solid view is called the workbench render engine, but we have a couple other render engines that we can choose too. If we go over to the render properties, which is in the properties editor, the icon with the back of the camera, we can set our render engine. 
Right now it's set to Eevee, but we also have options for Workbench and Cycles. There are also other render engines available out there that you can load in as an add-on if you need to. But for now, let's just stick with what's available inside of Blender by default. Let's load up a file that's a little bit more interesting so that we can really see the differences between all of these render engines. For that, I'll go to File, and just open up the game device preview.blend that's included in the source files. As I mentioned before, what we see here in the 3D viewport is the Workbench render engine. So if I set my render engine over to Workbench in the render properties, and I go ahead and hit F12, then we'll see something that's pretty similar to what's in the viewport, but it is a little bit different. That's because the settings that we have for working in the viewport are different than the settings for actually rendering out the image. To see that, we should switch to our rendered view. So up here at the top, we have these differently shaded orbs, and we've already looked at wireframe view and solid view, but there's also a material preview and a rendered view. Now in the Workbench render engine, we don't have a material preview, so we can skip that one for now, but we'll come back to it in just a second. If we set it to rendered view though, then we'll see what happens when we change any one of these settings in the render properties. For example, if I switch the studio light around, then it'll be reflected in the viewport. And then whenever I render this with the hotkey F12, then that's exactly what I'll get. So you can go through and test all these settings, but they're exactly the same as the settings that we have in solid view. And since it's meant for working in the viewport, it's going to be incredibly simple and straightforward. Things get a little bit more exciting though when we switch over to a more realistic render engine. Let's switch the render engine from Workbench to Cycles. Cycles is a path tracer, which means that it tries to simulate rays of light as accurately as possible. To see this in our viewport, let's just switch from Solid View to Rendered View. You'll notice that it starts out very pixelated and then gets more refined and less noisy over time. The way that you can think about it for now though, is that when you're looking through the camera or through the 3D viewport, every single pixel here is trying to trace a ray of light and each one is a little bit randomized, hence the noise. But over time, those randomized results kind of converge into an average and that average is what we see at the very end. So path tracing is a little bit more expensive, it's a little bit more slow and definitely going to be more demanding on your hardware than something that's real time. But the upside is that it's going to be a lot easier to make something realistic because everything like shadows and ambient occlusion and all of that fancy stuff just happens by default. The other render engine that's built into Blender is Eevee. So let's switch to that. Since we're still in rendered mode, it'll go ahead and switch over and we'll see something that looks incredibly similar to Cycles, but just a little bit different and without the noise. Eevee is a real-time rasterization render engine similar to a lot of game engines like Unreal. It's incredibly fast and looks remarkably similar to Cycles in a lot of different scenarios. But the thing to know about Eevee is that it's not a magic bullet. It does this by taking a lot of shortcuts, and sometimes those shortcuts need a lot of manual fine-tuning in order for it to look good. That's why I actually often recommend beginners start out with Cycles, because there's very little manual fine-tuning in order to get your materials and your lights and your shadows to work like you would expect. But in Eevee, you're probably going to need to do a good amount of manual tweaking in order to get things to look right. Both are incredibly helpful and incredibly powerful, they just have different use cases. Now let's take a second look at these differently shaded icons here in the top right. We've looked at wireframe view and solid view and rendered view, but now let's look at material preview. This is where we can get a fast approximation of our materials without all of the fancy effects. Material preview will always be using the Eevee render engine behind the scenes. So even if we set our render engine to cycles, we can still quickly preview our materials here. Then to see things as cycles, we can switch over to the rendered preview. And let's take a look at a couple other questions that you might have right out of the gate. The first is how to save things in different formats. If we were to render out our image, we could go to image and of course save or save as, and then we could set the file format here. But if we want the file format to be the same every time that we render, or if we want to set it for a movie type, then what we can do is go to the render output properties. So I'll go ahead and close these windows out. And let's switch from the render properties, which is the back of the camera icon, to the output properties, which is the printer icon. Here's where we can set things like the resolution, the aspect ratio, the frame rate, the frame range, but also the output. Here we can specify a file path for the default, and we can set a file format. If we set it to something like a JPEG, then every time that we render and hit save, then it'll default to a JPEG. But of course, I wouldn't recommend saving things out as a JPEG most of the time. I'd rather stick with PNG or TIFF is also a really good one. I'll go with PNG here. But if you wanted to render out an animation as a movie, which oftentimes you want to do as a sequence of images, but if you really want to save something out as a movie, then you can set this to one of the movie formats, which I would recommend the FFmpeg video. That way, if you go to render and render animation, it'll render all of the frames in your timeline here. 
I won't do that for now, we'll take a look at animations a little bit later. I'll go ahead and switch this back to PNG. And the very last thing that I want to point out is how to make something transparent, just because that's a super common question. If we look at our previous render, which we can always find by going to render and view render, or use the hotkey F11, then we can see that the background here is transparent. And if I save this out as a transparent PNG, I'll go ahead and close that out. Uh, let's switch this to RGBA instead of just RGB. The A stands for the alpha channel, and we want that in addition to the red, green, and blue colors. But we also have to make sure that the renderer is set to have a transparent background, and we can do that in the render properties. Again, this is one of those slightly more obscure things, but it's something people want to know right off the bat, generally. So in order to do that, we need to go to our render properties, down to film, and just choose transparent. And we can see the difference here in the rendered view. If I switch over here, if I turn off transparent, then we have our background here, which I've set up to be in HDRI. But as soon as I turn transparent on, then that just goes away and we're left with just our objects on top of a transparent background. So we can stick this over any other video or image in a different program. This is the exact same as Eevee. If we switch over from cycles to Eevee, then we can find that same settings under the film section in the render properties. Again, just check on transparent and now you have a transparent background. And lastly, one reminder from when we talked about viewing things in the viewport is that the camera icon in the outliner turns things on and off for the render separately from the eye icon, which is only for the viewport. So if I look at this from our camera view here, and let's say I turn the eye icon off for the pedestal collection, so we're not seeing it in the viewport, but if I go ahead and hit F12 and render this out, then that pedestal is still going to be there because I only turned it off for the viewport and not for the render. So if we wanted to do that, we could either uncheck the collection, which will turn it off for everything, or I could turn it off just with the camera icon. And now if I hit F12, then it's not going to be there. So another super common question that I get is why is something looking different in the viewport than in the rendered view? And nine times out of 10, it's because something is not visible in the viewport, but it is in the rendered view. And just one more reminder about that. If you go to the filter options in the outliner and turn on the monitor icon, then you'll also get that option as well. And you'll see what's disabled in the viewport rather than just what's hidden with the eye icon. So again, difference between viewport and render, check the outliner. I realize we breezed through quite a lot of info here and skipped over some things, but we'll talk a lot more about this in the very next course when we actually go through and model and texture and render out this game device and further on in later courses down the road. The fundamentals of digital lighting and the fundamentals of materials and shading courses on CG Cookie are especially packed with information on how to use these render engines to their full potential. For now though, I just wanted to make sure that you knew how to save your 3D scene as an image so you can share it with friends and family.